Hi, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri appellate attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Sometimes people's lust for money is so powerful that it can make them throw away all pretense of humanity. I have a story like that today. It was midsummer in 2001 when a friend of mine called me on the phone and said, Hey, Tony, have you seen what's going on with this pharmacist? And I said, No. And he said, Well, there's a pharmacist up here in Kansas City and he's diluted the chemotherapy and I got chemotherapy from him. And I said, Well, you know, let me look into it. So looked into it, and sure enough, this gentleman had been uh, given diluted chemotherapy. So I and my colleagues filed a class action lawsuit on behalf of all the patients of that particular clinic. And there were several other lawyers, very good lawyers, might, I might add, who also filed class actions. And it was interesting to me on two levels because Kansas City tends to have a very collegial plaintiff's bar. And instead of fighting each other on who was first and who was second, we all just more or less agreed to work together to help these people. I'll tell you why this was such a sad case and why it was so hard for me. I worked for 13 years as a respiratory therapist, and the person who called me was a respiratory therapist, a good guy. And it bothered me that somebody in the healthcare professions would do what this gentleman was alleged to have done. The FBI alleged, and I think ultimately it was proven, particularly with regard to drugs like Jim's are, that Courtney's motivation was financial. Uh, Gemzar is a very expensive chemotherapy agent, and just the powder alone can retail for $783, and that's a big chunk of money. Well, when you add in uh, all of the procedures for uh, giving the drug by IV, it gets even more expensive, and we believe that's why he did it. He could effectively buy one vial of Gemzar for $783, and then give it to 15 or 20 patients instead of giving it to one patient individually. And as a result, the profits would simply roll in at that point. In a nutshell, for those of you who do not remember the Courtney case, he was a pharmacist who worked, he had a, a business at Research Hospital in Kansas City. And whenever someone would get a, an order for chemotherapy, had an infusion facility there, and he would mix and administer, and his nurses would administer this chemotherapy. Well, one of the things that began to sort of grow out of uh, his operations is that people would come back to the doctor a week after having been infused with chemotherapy, and the doctor would say, well, how are you doing? He said, well, I'm doing fine. Really? He said, chemo didn't bother you? No. I it didn't hurt me at all. Didn't feel a thing. It was wonderful. Best chemo I've ever had. And the reason, of course, the chemo didn't have any impact on them was because they weren't actually getting very much chemo. If, it, if a patient was supposed to get a 99% dose of something like Gemzar, they were getting a 1% dose. So it wasn't treating the cancer and it wasn't doing anything for them. There were two sort of tracks on this case. One of those tracks was with respect to the pharmacist himself, and we certainly went after the pharmacist. But the other was with respect to Squibb and Eli Lilly, the two pharmaceutical manufacturers. So how did Mr. Courtney get caught? Well, there were really two things that happened that sort of piqued the interest of the clinicians involved. One of them was that drug companies have detail reps. 
detail reps are people who come and bring pizza and soft drinks and, uh, you know, desserts and that kind of stuff to doctor's offices at lunch and then put on a continuing medical education about their particular drug. And the gentleman who had the Gemsar drug would come in and do his little song and dance and he would tell the oncologists there about how good this drug was and they really ought to prescribe it more. And every time he went to see these doctors, they would say, well, we're prescribing the heck out of it. And he couldn't figure out how that was because nobody was buying the heck out of it. So he made reports to his company and the company in an, in an exchange between two uh, executives, I guess would thing would be to say, said, well, we realize there are some problems here, but you know, better to let sleeping dogs lie. In addition to what the pharma rep was telling the pharma company, the pharma company had these printouts from a company that monitored drug sales. And basically this company went out and got all of the detail from all of the pharmacists with respect to all the drugs they were buying so that it could provide this information about market share to the various companies. So that the companies could see, for example, how, you know, somebody's cyclosporin drug was doing against some other cyclosporin drug. It was a good situation and a good company to do that. I mean, they made good money doing it, but they didn't analyze the data. They just collected the data and reported it on. Once it got to the drug companies, and there were two of them, once it got to those two drug companies, that's where the people looked at it and said, yeah, geez, there's something fishy here. The doctors are telling us that we are prescribing it, but the pharmacists are not buying it. And that doesn't track up. That's where the, you know, we'll just let sleeping dogs lie thing came from. Well, the sleeping dogs came back to bite the people who let them lie because the drug companies allowed him to get away with diluting this chemotherapy. And the dilution was such that the chemotherapy had no impact on the cancer. And they should have known that. And they should have at least investigated, even if they didn't know it for sure. That was one way he was caught. The other way he was caught is there was a physician who kept seeing patients that she had prescribed this for not lose their hair, not get sick, not have any effect from the drug as you would expect them to have. And so she went to the FBI, the FBI did an investigation, and the FBI arrested him. And here is where I sort of forgot to tell you the inside baseball on this. When Mr. Courtney was arrested, the FBI and the federal courts seized all of his assets. They seized his pharmacy and his bank accounts. And so it looked to us like there would probably not be any chance for a real recovery from Mr. Courtney. That was one of the reasons why the drug companies were pursued in this, is because we felt they had liability, but also they were solvent and they could pay a large judgment if we could get it from them. He was tried, he was convicted, he was sentenced to 30 years in federal prison, and he's due to get out in, I believe, uh, 2031 or 2032. I guess 2032. He got 30 years. Because in the federal system, if you get 30 years in prison, you're going to do 30 years. Or you're at least going to do 29 years in six months. In the last six months, you spend at a halfway house. During the pandemic, there was some move as a matter of humane treatment to let him out during the pandemic. And the people in Kansas City sort of rose up as one and said, uh-uh, not this guy. Don't you dare let him out. And his compassionate release was ultimately not approved. So that is the story of Robert Courtney, probably the most disreputable pharmacist to ever have RPH behind his name. The, the, real, the real tragedy in all of this is that people who came to us basically said, yeah, we're, we're just bereft. He's stolen my hope. I had the hope that this drug would cure me or at least give me you know, more time with my family. And instead, because of what he did, I'm going to die sooner. I remember going out to a young lady's house, a young lady, 30 years old, with breast cancer, and talking with her about what happened, getting her statement. 
And four days later, I called back to see if I could come out and get one more thing from her. And the person who answered the phone said that she had passed away that evening. It was a very emotional case for all of us who worked on it. We did a lot of really good legal work to get the case to the point where it would settle. And when the case was tried, the civil case was tried against Robert Courtney, it resulted in, I think it was $4 billion in damages. Of course, he'll never be able to pay that. But it was an attempt to send a message. And the lawyers who got that, including a great guy by the name of Grant Davis, deserved every good thing that happened to him as a result of that because they stood up for what was right. If you have any questions about this, please feel free to leave them in the comments down below. Like, share, subscribe, you know all the stuff we ask you to do. And if you have the opportunity today, unlike Mr. Courtney, take time to be nice to people. You never know what kind of struggles people are going through, and sometimes just a kind word is enough to keep people from stepping over the precipice, so to speak. Have a wonderful day. We'll catch you on here next time. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.